it really feels like what's carrying this episode is how so many people feel not just sadness for losing Luceris, but almost a little bit of guilt. Crazy Stupid Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. As always, if this is your first time watching, we'd love it if you could hit the like button, the subscribe button, and the bell so that you are aware of when we post things. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Crazy Stupid Podcast. The long-awaited season premiere of season two of House of the Dragon finally aired. If we sound a little bit less excited than you would expect, <laughs> it is because following our viewing of that episode last night, we recorded this entire episode. Oh my God. And that entire footage has been lost. So we are re-recording this episode again. <laughs> Let us jump in. They start us off with the fucking Starks, baby. Listen, all I needed to hear was just a couple of notes of that violin. One. It was quite literally one note. It's That's all like I needed <laughs> to know that we was fucking back. All my all my team start <laughs> niggas out there. You know what I'm saying? We back oh, in man. full force. Well, not really, because I don't think you'll have that many scenes this season. But that guy seems like he's going to be important. Oh, yes. <laughs> they casted a very captivating actor. Yes. Shout out to Ramin Jawadi, man. I don't think Game of Thrones would have been this successful without him. It elevates so much of the scene. Yeah. I mean, think of some of your most iconic Daenerys moments, you're thinking about that soundtrack. The Stark soundtrack is also like an iconic one, which is why like it was so recognizable for me. Part of the genius in what he did was each house sort of had their own theme, which made it easier for like new viewers, maybe people that didn't read the books to know where you were, especially those first couple of seasons when you got introduced to like 50 characters. But yes, we started off in the North and Winterfell north. briefly, and then we go to the wall. I really find it funny how like the North in the world of Game of Thrones. It has like this reputation. It's like when you talk about people from a certain side of town. <laughs> yeah. It was like, yeah, they're going to fight like Northerners. I was like, okay. <laughs> a, little, a little rough around the edges. Also, when Jace is like, bro, it's cold. And Cregan Stark's like, this is summer. <laughs> yeah. He what? was like, no, no. <laughs> Jace was like, what do you mean? We <laughs> He was like, what do you mean winter is coming? What is this then? <laughs> <laughs> you know what it remind me of? There's that scene with Torben. Him and John always had funny moments, but there's that one scene when he was like, essentially like, I'm I'm tired of, you know, being in the South. And then he was like, and then John was like, you've never been South. And then Torben says, I've been to Winterfell. And then John says, that's the North. And Torben <laughs> says, like, no. <laughs> oh. That's so funny. I also think that some very valid points were made in that conversation that I do think people should have been thinking about later. Like when Jace is like, so while you're up here fighting the weather is savages, we got a whole bunch of serious stuff going on down south. And then Regan is like, you think that we built this big wall because of the wildlings and snow? <laughs> Let's you put our thinking He's caps like, on. like, are you guys serious? <laughs> Which is like, yeah, like looking at that now, like it kind of does seem like people should have been a little bit more aware of like, there's got to be more going on out there. Yeah. Because why do we have this giant fortress up? I loved the little lore addition that they added with King Jaehaerys and Queen Alicent, I think that's how you pronounce it. Because in the books, it does say that they that they visited the wall. People did have some, maybe some thoughts on like, maybe the theories really came into fruition after the, the bomb drop in episode one of last season, when we realized this is something that had been passed down to every Targaryen. And then there were, a lot of people that were like, well, like, why, you know, did such and such not care about X, Y, and Z? But then when you see that Jaehaerys and his wife go to the wall, then you start to think, oh, interesting. I also like that little tidbit of information because it shows that the, house of, the houses of Stark and Targaryen have like this intertwined history mm -hmm. that's like been intertwined for literally generations and generations. Yeah. And then that comes back full circle, obviously, at the end of Game of Thrones. As different from each other as they are, have always sort of been connected in this way through this prophecy which yeah i think is a nice touch i still feel that damon implying to rainis that she did not do enough and that she should have just ended things right there with aegon i still feel like that is full of entitlement because as far as rainis and corlys know rainira and damon are responsible for the death of their son 
With that in mind, they have still, they have still backed up Jaceris and Lucerus's inheritance of Driftmark, allowed their granddaughters to marry Jaceris and Lucerus to strengthen that connection between their two houses. Mm-hmm. Rhaenys is the reason why Rhaenyra found out about the about the throne being usurped and Corlys with the Black Aid. They did all of that while still believing that their son was unalived by these two people for you guys to go to these people and ask them for more to me is crazy as far as rainy and Corlys are concerned with the knowledge that they have done they have done way more than they are obligated to do for you guys way more i think that damon believes that everybody should feel as urgently and strongly about this conflict as he does i think that it's actually so assumptive of him to think that somebody like a Masaria or even an Eric to a lesser extent, but definitely like a Masaria yeah. would give a shit about what these powerful houses are doing. Like these people do not care about the politics because they know that none of you guys care about them. Right. They're looking out for themselves. And I think that there's this sense of entitlement that when we play political games for the betterment of our houses, that's valid and that's worth it. But when you lowborn people start getting in on this get on these games and you start playing and angling for your own personal gain, that you're in the wrong. I think that's silly. It's also sort of revealing the irony in what power sort of looks like in Westeros to an extent because Damon feels very powerless and he goes to people who he kind of inadvertently admits in certain contexts had more power than he did and it kind of reminded me of that quote that Varys says to Tyrion where he goes to that little riddle and he says power resides where men believe it resides and then he Mm. goes through all these examples Damon a prince he has dark sister he has Craxies, but he's looking at all of these people beneath him to be the ones to keep his power and Rhaenyra's power in, intact. And I found that kind of interesting that he doesn't recognize how fickle monarchy power really is because you rely on so many people. I also think that that conversation with Masaria and that realization, I think is what gives him the idea to go to blood and cheese. I think Mm. hearing Masaria and getting the perspective of, oh, like these people don't really care about what's going on. They just are looking out for themselves. I can buy an, I can buy their allegiance very easily. I think that concept possibly is what gives him the idea of I can just find some regular people yeah. <laughs> to go and do this. He's just not processing any of this well. This is not in defense of Damon. I'm just trying to get a little bit deeper understanding of where, where he's coming from. He's a loose cannon and he's like, why is no one else sharing my same anger and vitriol that I do? Because he lost Viserys, Rhaenyra lost the throne. Because of that, they had the miscarriage and then they lose Lucerys. Four of those things happening in the span of what? doesn't feel like a very long time between each other. In his mind, all of that should have been enough to be all out war. I also think that's just how he processes grief. I think he processes grief through anger and what I can do to right this situation Mm -hmm. to, to get back at those people. And that's just not necessarily how everybody's grieving process looks, at least not right away. As we see in this episode, Rhaenyra does come to that place eventually. Yeah. But I think he doesn't understand the the space in between, like before being angry, just being sad and like needing to sit in that. I think he doesn't get that because he's just never really acknowledged that part of his emotional being. I'm very nervous about Damon. As you said, loose cannon, right? Like a lot just happened. He does not know how to process this. I don't think that we need to worry about him being like power hungry and jealous of Rhaenyra. I don't think that angle would make sense for his character personally. That to me doesn't make sense. But what I do worry about is it seems like Rhaenyra is going to sort of push him away and distance herself from him a little bit because of how he has been behaving since the end of last season. Yeah. Because we know yeah. that he is a person that in a way similar in a sense to like Aegon and Aemond and Alicent's kids has also been on the search for like belonging and validation first from Viserys, right? Like that's like his whole thing. He doesn't acknowledge it, but he needs it. 
And Viserys is gone, and he finds out also that Viserys never told him about that prophecy. Yeah. And now at Rhaenyra is going to start to also sort of push him away and show a lack of faith and trust in him. I don't know. I think that's going to be bad. It's hard to gauge with the blood and cheese decision how much of this was incompetence on Damon's side or if this was just flat out ruthlessness. Because I was thinking about that line that showed up in the show and also shows up in the book that a son for a son. And the way that they sort of frame it in the show, to me, it sort of felt like the way that it was instructed to blood and cheese was the answer to the question that we didn't get to see him give them, which was, if we can't get Eamon, then what do we do next? And so perhaps Damon then says, well, a son for a son, as in giving them other options for things that they can do in response to that. So it's hard to know like what Damon says in that moment because they cut away from that scene. And they cut in a very unsettling way. Yeah, and they, he kind of had like a bit of a smirk on his yeah. face. To me, I read that he was going to say something else, give them an alternative for what they could do. I, I think that that cut was very, very intentional. I think it does leave room for that interpretation. I also just think the plan even if you give it the most generous interpretation mm -hmm. is just so bad because in no world are a random rat exterminator <laughs> and a random guard going to be able to defeat Eamon. That vengeance wasn't Damon's to take. Well, Rhaenyra gives him the okay to take it, which I think like that mm -hmm. to me is okay. What I was saying that about was when he's going to Rhaenys at the beginning mm -hmm. and is trying to go behind Rhaenyra's back to take vengeance. That to me is like an overstep because yeah. you're not allowing Rhaenyra to be involved in this process of avenging her son. But then Rhaenyra comes back and gives Damon the okay. She looks directly at That's him true. across the table and says, I want Aemon Targaryen. Yeah. So he has the okay. It's just like, why did he choose this? Why, why was this his plan? I think he was trying to find something that could cut deep. So you think he never intended to get Aemon? I don't know, but I think he chooses the blood and cheese route because I don't think Rhaenyra would have sanctioned sending them, sending both Rhaenys and Daemon on dragons to King's Landing. I think that's just super risky. I think the blood and cheese removes the casualty of people on her council. The part where it's frustrating for Rhaenyra's end, what we talked about last time, is she kind of loses the moral high ground a bit. This idea of at this particular moment, the word of Aemon being a kinslayer is spreading throughout the realm. That could have been a talking point that they could have used to leverage more people to bring on to the black side. But now you learn that not only did the Greens, you know, take out Lucerys, but now the blacks are responsible for taking out a child. That's your kin. That like, feels like a, ickier. A child. Lucerys was also a child. But that was like a baby. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like a toddler. That feels ickier to me and no, so it's bad it's it, really bad the optics are bad he's kind of crippled her politically a bit here the other thing too that i was thinking about one is that what we see from this episode in t from team green is that i think they're at their weakest point that we've seen them in the show so far yeah because they're not in agreement with each other oh yeah there's a lot of infighting happening because there's you know people are pl are playing against each other for influence over Aegon. People are disagreeing on how we should go about this. You got Laris in there throwing his two cents in, mm -hmm. which is scary. You have all this stuff going on. And I think it is the weakest that Team Green has been strategically because they can't act because they can't agree. Yeah. And what you have essentially done now is gotten them all in one accord. <laughs> There's going to be no issues now because nobody cares anymore. Yeah. Also, the other thing that's happened is that up to this point, what we've seen is that the thing that's been holding everybody back has been the affection that Rhaenyra and Allison have for each other. That has been the biggest force, honestly, that has been preventing all out war and like wanton violence on either side because both Allison and Rhaenyra were practicing restraint out of respect for each other. Mm -hmm. What we see in this episode is Rhaenyra finally letting that go. Like she's finally saying they have gone too far, Understand? and understandably she's like, whatever I feel for Allison, whatever, like that is gone and I'm going in because she's asking for Allison's son's head. Yep. Like that's done, like you, you're like, I don't care anymore. 
We see in this episode that Allison isn't there yet. She lights that candle for Luceris. She still has that affection and empathy for Rhaenyra that's still sort of guiding her choices a little bit. And like, sure, it seems very naive and silly, but it is slowing down the Green's ability to move. Yeah. And I think now that's going to be gone for Allison too. Mm -hmm. I think that once she finds out about her grandchild, and the, I mean, it's so gruesome what they've Violent. done. The way that Helena was handled and, and what they've done to Helena. I, I think that that's just going to be done. And I think now we're, there's nothing holding anybody back anymore. Mm -hmm. I agree with what you're saying that this felt like the weakest that they've been primarily because there was so much internal fighting. But I also think they are not being honest about how many of them have like ulterior motives, like differing motives that's what's sort of driving them. I think they're not being honest with the fact that Otto has a lot of resentment for Allison and not letting him get to Egon first because he thinks that if they could have quickly taken out Rhaenyra, things would have gone a lot smoother. Allison has a lot of resentment for Aemon, which understandably so, because she even admits like what Lucerys does to Aemon was violent, but that crossed a completely different line. And I also think that Egon isn't being honest about how loyal Aemon is. Yeah. When, when he's drunk on that Iron Throne, he's like, yeah, you know, I can summon Aemon and Vagar like a dog, essentially. So it's like, yeah. I don't think any of them are fully on the same page at all. No. I think the thing that Aegon doesn't understand about Aemon is that Aemon is smarter than him. Yes. And so Aemon is behaving in such a manner that allows him to stay in the room. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. There's no loyalty there. He just wants to be there so that he has some say in the matter. And I think Otto recognizes that intelligence that Aemon has. Mm -hmm. And that sort of shed its light when they had that scene together mm -hmm. where he breaks down, listen, I know you want to do all this. I understand it completely, but we got to reel it in because you know your brother, he can't handle this. Yeah. Um, I also don't think he would have been able to have that conversation with Eamon without the insight from Allison that he gets earlier. Because Allison yeah. in that conversation really kind of breaks down He's angry. the motivation. I think what she says to Otto about how they both look to him as the great example, I don't think Otto had considered that. Yeah. About how you are essentially the father figure that they did not have mm -hmm. because their own father did not really show up for them in any meaningful way and you are the closest and he's also gone now so you are the next closest thing that they have they see how you've been able to you know handle yourself in this in this world so well mm -hmm. they're looking to you and i don't think he thought about that and then when she explains like where they're both what's rooted what's kind of grounding each of them where they're both rooted in aemon in his anger and Aegon in his you know seeking you know validation approval i think he needed that insight to have that conversation Rewatching it again i really appreciate the complexities they're adding to Aegon's character mm -hmm. i think they are fleshing it out so well well, because it, you can still feel the weight and the consequences of Viserys' actions and not being a good father. And you see that directly through Aegon and what he does. So obviously he brings Jaehaerys into the room, into this small council meeting, and he does it in a very playful way, but like they're both kind of trolling the Lannister guy. Now, it's a bonding moment for the two of them. Yes, yeah. and honestly, I wanted to see the pony ride. I'm gonna be real. <laughs> I do not like that Lannister guy. I was very much frustrated that Allison cut that out I'll be very honest I think Egon he desperately wanted that mm -hmm. from Viserys and I think because he didn't get it I think Egon had a chip on his shoulder of wanting to be seen and wanting to be liked and I think that's why he reacted that way when all of those people were coming with those petitions he just kind of wanted to give them anything that they wanted because I think he really wants people to like him I also think that he feels a little indebted to them I don't know because they are actually the first group of people to that acknowledge yes him. yes yes because some of the things that he says, like when that when he's talking to the blacksmith mm -hmm. and he's like, our victory is dependent on the efforts of the small folk. Yeah. It's a level of acknowledgement of their importance that is hasn't really happened. <laughs> Especially on Team Black. Remember what Rhaenyra says, yeah. like the small folks <laughs> desires of little importance to me, which is completely different to what Egon says here. Yeah, I think that there's a little bit of that. And I also think what you said last night is also true that I think he's just also really trying to be worthy of this position. I think it kind of jolted him a little bit back into reality. And I think both Alicent and Egon know that the claim 
what they're holding onto with Viserys is very fickle. I think they both know that. And I so, so I think a lot of what we're seeing from Aegon in this first episode is saying, I still feel like I need to prove my father wrong, even though my mom tried to give me the validation that I always needed. So I think he's trying his best to be as kingly as he can be, because I don't think he fully believes this idea that Viserys finally accepted him. No, I don't think so at all. I have to say, I honestly felt genuinely bad for him for a moment in that scene when the first guy comes up and he's like, yeah, we'll give you back your sheep and stuff. And he has a moment with Otto, which <laughs> honestly, I'm sorry, that actor is so funny. The actor playing Aegon has such good comedic timing. Yes. When he was like, they're not gonna know. <laughs> <laughs> but after that, as they keep going with the petitions, you see this moment from Aegon where he's looking down, he's like fiddling with his fingers. He looks looks very fragile to me, very insecure. Ooh, a little bit like Alicent too with the finger thing. Oh, true. I didn't think about yeah, that. Yeah, out of place here. Yes, I feel like that imposter syndrome is kicking his ass. Ooh. And I think a lot of it is because he was never prepared for this partially because he was never supposed to do it, yeah. but also because he was like, as far as we can tell, generally ignored by his father. Mm -hmm. So I think that's also really eating at him. Like all of these people are like forced me to this position essentially. When I finally got there, got here, it's not as bad as I wanted it to be, but none of them actually prepared me for it. Right. A lot of blame goes on Viserys' end, but there's also a lot of blame on, on Alicent. Yep. I want to always empathize for Alicent, but it it is tough to see how Rhaenyra treats her children with so much warmth and comfort and, and love and to see how that's lacking so much for how Allison interacts with her kids because you see they're all wounded because of it, really. Mm -hmm. They did not have just a functioning parentage in general from, from both of them. And I know we mentioned a little bit this last time, what makes it sort of ironic is that it does, to some extent, feel like Allison is a little envious of not just Rhaenyra's mothering, but also how Rhaenyra's kids turned out. Because in this episode, Jaceris, that nigga looks like a king, bro. Mm -hmm. He pulled in two great houses. Mm -hmm. He went up to the wall like he's doing his thing. And not to mention, like, granted you know, like the Starks aren't gonna break their oath, but they're also very stubborn people. And he was able to find a compromise with Cregan to bring p soldiers down to come down south. And he's doing that by himself. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, y'all got a baby Egon, <laughs> who's supposed to be king. And I think that probably drives her insane because a little bit what you were saying, I don't think she ever had the emotional growth needed because of how traumatic Otto was to her and so she probably doesn't have the capacity to do that for her kids and I think she also knows it but it's just kind of like you gotta try <laughs> I don't know like you you gotta try I would argue that this is her trying I guess that's fair yeah I think this is her trying and that's not to excuse it completely but I think that what we see from Rhaenyra towards her children is a direct result of what Rhaenyra received from Viserys. Yes, yes, yes. Rhaenyra is only able to do this because she also had that relationship mm -hmm. with her own father mm -hmm. all the way through to the end, no matter what. That love was unconditional. Yeah. No matter what she did, he was always going to stand behind her and he was always going to show how much he cared and loved for her and supported her. And that's yeah. why she's able to show up like that. Two, all of her children are the result of actual love. That's true. All of her kids from both uh, Strong mm -hmm. and from Damon are the result of genuine loving relationships that she wanted to be in. Mm -hmm. I think what we're seeing from Allison is her best attempt. There is genuine care and affection for them mm -hmm. that you see in the way that she talks about them. She has a lot of empathy for them yeah. and a lot of sympathy and understanding for their pain. I just don't think she knows how to do it any better than this. Yeah, it really feels like what's carrying this episode is how so many people feel not just sadness for losing Lucerus, but almost a little bit of guilt, mm -hmm. right? I think Rhaenyra is spending so much time trying to find his remains because I think she probably feels guilty that she sent him on that mission on his own. I also think Corliss feels a little guilty because Luke was his heir and he wasn't around to maybe properly train him up to like 
take on Driftmark. When he receives that gift from Alan, I felt like- Like regret. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know? Like lost time. Yeah. And I would also say that Jace feels some regret as well idea. because he's the one right that suggests that they are the ones that deliver the message and the last scene that the two of them have together was when they were sparring and he's actually pretty aggressive with him he's yelling at him and i wonder if that's like the last memory he has of him interacting with his brother and seeing how all of them are sort of reacting like i mean even at the funeral you saw reyna like in tears and it's interesting because rainier's kids didn't have as much screen time as the adults did but you they did such a good job of letting you feel the weight of how losing luke is impacting so many people because even with damon he's not he's not like crying or anything but he's very angry he he mentions it multiple times where like luke would have still been alive luke would have still been alive and it's just sad you know it ripples across even onto the green side yeah all of the people in the council like nobody is happy that that happened on either side like in that council meeting nobody thinks this was good mm -hmm. Otto does not think it was good mm -hmm. like nobody is like this was a great move <laughs> everybody regrets it look Allison, get your nut off. Like, that's cool. Do your thing, you know? But, well, you know what I mean? But, but I'm not judging Allison for doing what she did. But as we said last time, I am judging her a little bit on who she chose. I and, and I think that's the difference because you know that Cole isn't allowed to do that. And so that speech that you give to Rhaenyra, what is duty, what is sacrifice, all of that, it kind of rings a little hollow. Now, granted, like we said, she doesn't have that many options of who she can sort of have that sort of loyalty and confidence with but honestly the second watch i actually am judging Kristen cole a little bit more than allison because that, he don't care no more he said here's the cloak put it back on well, this is a, <laughs> <laughs> he said here it is you know what's so funny he's mad at radira when he's like so you want me to be your whore my brother in Christ, what do you think you are to Allison? <laughs> like, what, think. I think this is the correct angle. I think he is the one that we should judge. <laughs> um, Stand up. <laughs> oh my God. I think, again, I do think that the passage of time is relevant to to the, the, the difference of people's stances. Because it's worth mm -hmm. noting, it's it's been like years since everything went down with Rainier and with and Kristen. More than that, like 15. It's yeah. been like, wait, it's been a lot. Now, here, here's what I think has happened with him. I think that what happened with Rhaenyra happened at a time where he still held on to those ideals very tightly. Oh. And I think that anger crystallized in that moment in time and it's just continued to just sort of fester. Where he is at right now, because of what has happened over the course of those years, I think his honor, it probably kind of feels like a lost cause. Like, you know what I mean? It, kind of, it probably kind of feels like, I mean, what, what's, what does it mean now? Yeah. Like, I already gave it up so many years ago, and then I, you know, I I ruined the wedding by bashing somebody's face in, and I, you know, like, I think he's probably done so much. Or Deesbury in episode nine. Yes, I think mm -hmm. he just thinks so lowly of himself now that that idea, it doesn't matter anymore. What happened with Anira happened when he had an actual sense of self. His pride is that gone. That he respected, and he doesn't have that anymore, so it doesn't matter now. Yeah. It's all very meaningless. Yeah. I think it's sad. He's a very annoying character, but I think if you look a little bit closer, I, I think that there is a little bit of empathy that can be had for him too. I would agree. We'd love to hear your thoughts in this episode. What'd you think? What'd you think about Blood and Cheese? And I would say perhaps who are some of your standout performances? I thought the actress who did Helena was 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 <sighs> phenomenal. Emma Darcy, Haunting. they're always good. Yeah. When Jace comes back, the second time around, I was like, oh, he was acting. Oh yeah, that was painful. Yeah. I, Helena to me, I think, because I think that the, Helena is such a peculiar character. Yeah. And so the way that she would respond in a situation like this has to be so specific. And I think the actress did such a good job. Nothing about it was like classic, like mother who lost it. It was, it was still very like odd and off, and off kilter, like in line with the way Helena always yeah, is. Yeah. But it was so deeply sad. 
haunted mm. and haunting. So next week, let us know in the comments what you think of this episode. Um, we'd love to hear your thoughts. And with that, we will see you all next time. Peace out, everyone. <laughs>